it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 756 for December 17th, 2022. And I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest for the last Chit Chat Across the Pond of the year is Bart Bouchatz, not with a programming by stealth, but with something maybe a little nerdy, not a little nerdy, a little bit mixed in. So it's going to be a light episode. Yeah, I think light works. Light, yeah, light. No, light works. Light works. Um, definitely tech, though, because hey, it is me. That's, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, there uh, you go. So, I've called it verification Twitter and Mastodon because the reason I started writing show notes was because I wanted to talk about verification on Mastodon. But when I pulled on the thread, more stuff came loose. So it's actually a bigger discussion about the concept of verification how Twitter used to do it and how Mastodon does it now and why it's different and what's different about okay. it. Okay. And we aren't going to talk politics. We aren't going to talk nope. about Nazis. We aren't going to talk about the person in charge of anything. We are just going to talk about these things, what they mean and what we do technically and what we do with it, right? Exactly. Yes, that is completely good. the point. Because to me, this is an excuse to have a bigger discussion. Um, ah, basically, good. all of this shenanigans has this in our minds and so now is actually an opportunity to have a conversation but what does it actually mean to be verified because lots of things say they're verified but when you see that something is verified i am going to make the argument that you need to ask yourself four questions every single time what is the claim being made what evidence is being offered to support the claim what checks are compare are performed to compare the evidence to the claim and by who? So think people, organizations, and software. And what's the process for sharing the result of that verification? Hmm. So, okay, because if you can fake, or if any of those things don't have correct value, then the whole thing is meaningless, right? If the claim being made doesn't mean what you think it means, the whole exercise is pointless. If the evidence doesn't actually prove the claim, the whole exercise is pointless. If the checks are done badly, wrongly, or corruptly, no point. And if there's no way to actually share the fact that it's been done without it being fakeable, still no point. Right? So you actually have to have all four. Okay. And so it doesn't really matter what it is that's being verified. Whenever you see that, you have to ask yourself, what? exactly is the claim being made here, right? So a classic example to me is the padlock on a website. There was a time when the media would say, look for the padlock and you know you're safe. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was never the claim being made by that padlock. The only thing that padlock was claiming was that the website you were at is the one in your address bar. That's it. That's the sum total of the claim the padlock makes. Now, you also need evidence then whenever you see something is verified. So what evidence does the claimant have to provide to back up the claim, right? Verification has to be supported by evidence or it's not verification. And the strength of the evidence is vital. So to get a basic HTTPS certificate, for example, you need to prove that you control the website by, you have a couple of methods. You can upload a special file, you can set a special DNS record, or you can reply to an email sent to a special address. But again, the claim is I own this website. The evidence is you have to prove your ownership through one of these mechanisms. And then there has to be a rigorous process whereby someone or something trustworthy actually compares the two things. You claim to own this website. You have to provide me with this evidence. Does that gel? Right. So, so again, things. that just says that there's a uh, connection between you and that website, that you own that website, that you were able to put that special file in place, but it doesn't say that your website is pure of heart. Precisely. Precisely. <laughs> okay. And then there has to be some sort of way of communicating the fact that all this has happened. There has to be a, a way of actually knowing that that little tick box is real that the padlock is real, that it means something. It has to be a way of actually communicating to you that we have done this work. And so that is, that's why there are these four steps, right? So the, what is being claimed? What's the evidence? How is it being checked by who? And how are we sharing the result of us having done this work? And it's, it's a chain. So the weakest point of those four is the total strength of the verification, whatever the thing is you're trying to verify. So 
let's dig into HTTPS in more detail as a good example, right? So uh, when you say HTTPS, there is one thing you can be guaranteed as being claimed, and that is that the address bar, the URL in the address bar is the URL of the server you are looking at. So the web page matches the address bar. That claim is universal every time you see HTTPS. So it means that no one managed to become a machine in the middle and send you to a wrong server by hijacking your DNS. No one managed to intercept the connection and stick wrong information in. So you know that what you're seeing really is the web page in the address bar. So the URL and where you are match. Now, it, um, but what's in the uh, URL bar might be Giggle, not Google. Correct. So the classic example is... But it's is absolutely Giggle. <laughs> Exactly. So if the URL bar says not your bank's URL, but the web page looks like your bank's URL, well, all the padlock means is that you really genuinely are securely <laughs> communicating with the bad guys. <laughs> right? Because the little HTTPS gives you encryption and all that good stuff, but you are encrypting to the bad guys. So right. in order to get your HTTPS search, what's actually had to happen is the owner of the website had to do something called Domain Control Validation, or DCV. And DCV can be entirely automated, which is why DCV certs can be free. That's why Let's Encrypt can be free, because the act of DCV is, can be purely automated. But if you actually want something stronger, you can actually make a second claim in your HTTPS cert. You can buy a cert that doesn't only say the address in the address bar is the website you're really at. It has a second claim. And the website is owned by this organization. It's called an OV certificate. So sometimes when you click on the padlock, it doesn't just tell you the URL, it also tells you the company. Wait, 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 OV. You can't throw acronyms out without telling us what they mean. Organizational, organization validation? I, 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 said, I think I said it a second ago, but let me just be double clear. O, o, OV is organization validation. It means that not only have you proved that you own the server, you have proved that you are the company you say you are. How would somebody... I, I don't I don't get it. I'm Podfeet Podcast Enterprises. How do I prove that I'm a co I represent that company? You Different would have from to to get OV is the reason OV search costs money is because the certificate authority would have to phone you on a number that they were able to get from a recognized directory. It's the bins directory of corporations is often used, or in the so I do this for work because we're a university, so we are established by law. So. I have to cite the uh, actual statute that made the university come into existence. And then they go to the university's register and they find the phone number for the university. And they have to be able to phone that phone number and get through to me. Otherwise, they will not verify that I am acting on behalf of the university. So to get an OV wow. cert is a giant pain in the backside. And the verification lasts for one year. And then you have to do it all again. So I'm very familiar with OV. How did you do result, that when you couldn't go into the office for three years? Oh, well, well, thanks to the magic of modern telephony, the telephone can come to me. Oh, okay. Uh, my, team, my team's client is my telephone number. So if you phone my desk, it actually rings wherever I am. Uh, the joys of modern telephony. And the, the horribleness of modern telephony. It all goes together. Um, so if you click on a certificate, sometimes it will actually say the name of the company in the certificate. And that is how that is done. That is an OV cert. And they cost money because it involved a human being making phone calls and all this kind of shenanigans. And it's a heck of a lot of work, so it actually does cost money to get an OV cert. So you're never going to get one of those for free from Let's Encrypt. Okay, so this is, this is verifying that a company is, is the company? It's verifying, okay, so it's verifying that you really are at the URL you think you are, and that URL belongs to that organization. Okay. So you really are at okay, right. paypal.com and paypal.com really does belong to PayPal Inc. Okay. Okay. So it's valuable, actually. Like banks and stuff really should have OV certs. You should be able to right. say that this really is Bank of America or whatever. But most people don't know to click on an OV cert. So most people don't click on the padlock to actually see the name of the company. So I, OV is one of these massive, big, this should be useful, but actually... Eh. And there's even okay. a thing called EV which is exactly the same as OV, but the level of proof is higher. Like, I don't know why you have to sell them a kidney or something. What's the E stand for? Extended. Oh, okay. And they used to turn green in the address bar, and then all the browsers got together and decided they couldn't be bothered, and so it's gone now. So I don't know why. Anyway. <laughs> okay. 
So the point is, the one claim is definitely the website really is the website, and the other optional claim is the organization actually owns that website. So how do you prove it? Well, we've already talked about the fact that you can set a special DNS record or whatever. We've already talked about the fact that there's all these horrible phone calls and things. So at that stage, we know what's being claimed and what the proof is. So how do we actually... Who's doing that verification? Who's doing that work of proving that the claim matches the evidence? Well, that's called a certificate authority. So for the cheap certs, the certificate authority runs some software. And the software does all the work. And at the end of the day, the certificate authority hands you out the certificate. No human involved. But the certificate authority was involved. So there's software being run by an organization. That software is using an open standard called Acme, believe it or not. Uh, obviously, they watch too many cartoons. Um, so there's actually already quite a lot in the trust here. But uh, how do you get to be a certificate authority? Like, who gets to be a CA? Well, there's actually the browser manufacturers really have the keys here. They decide who is and isn't trusted. But they do that in an industry organization where they all get together and they make rules. And then everyone who wants to be a certificate authority has to follow the rules. And there's auditors sent out to make sure you follow the rules. And if you break the rules, you're, you get taken out of the browser. And so there's this massive process. So all of this work has gone into just that simple claim of this really is my website. Okay. And I do, I do know we've had a case of a certificate authority stopping being trustworthy. I forget what they did wrong, but there was one that I remember you told us about that they, uh, they did something naughty and it was like, nope, you're not that anymore. Yeah, they issued a, um, they issued a government the right to issue certificates, which basically meant that all of the checks were being bypassed, right? Because the rules are you're supposed to do all of these checks before you give out a certificate, but they gave the right to make certificates to someone who wasn't following the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, they were thrown out. Okay, and good. Well, that's good. Happened. It's good though that that means the system was working as designed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then the final. So that's three out of the four. So how do we communicate this fact? Well, we use cryptography. So what's actually handed to you is a certificate that you install on your web server, and that certificate is digitally signed by the certificate authority using their certificate and. Their certificate's public key is hard-coded into your browser. So your browser has the key to the certificate authority. The certificate authority has the key to your cert. And so you have this chain of trust from the browser trust to CA. The CA has verified your certificate. Your certificate says you really are you. And so that is how it all I works. Missed, one part of that made no sense to me. You said the, uh, the cert is stored locally on my computer. So your I go server. to... You, as What's, the owner of potfeet.com, have ah, installed the cert I on Potfeet.com. I thought you were talking to the user. Okay, start it over again. Tell me, tell me the whole thing again, because okay. I thought so you were you talking to So you want to prove that you own your website, right? Okay. You, you want to prove that you own potfeet.com. I want okay. to have a nice, secure padlock. So you go to Let's Encrypt, say, right? Mm -hmm. And you run their software, and their software will do the verification that you... It, the way it actually works is it actually puts a file on your website, checks the file, and then deletes the file off your website and gives you a certificate. So they've actually completely okay. automated the whole proof part as well. Okay. But they, you actually have proven you own the website because they have put a special file there. Their server has checked that the file is at the URL and then they have issued a certificate. And that certificate is installed onto your server that is hosting potfeet.com, which means that no other server on planet Earth can have a padlock and say potfeet.com. Right? Okay. They, okay. And that certificate has been digitally signed by Let's Encrypt. And Let's Encrypt's certificate is stored in your browser. So your browser knows Let's Encrypt. Let's Wait, Encrypt am I still podfeet.com? Am no, I still sorry. Allison? Let, okay, let's change that. Alistair, Grup. just to really okay. confuse things. Or, no, actually, let's go with someone who doesn't have an A initial. Sorry, Alistair. Helma <laughs> goes to visit podfeet.com. Helma's browser trusts Let's Encrypt because Let's Encrypt have not broken the rules. They okay. are still in the good books. So the browser has Let's Encrypt's uh, root certificate. Let's Encrypt signed your certificate. Therefore, your browser trusts your certificate. Sorry, Helma's browser trusts Podfeet's certificate. <laughs> okay. Been, right? So it's called the chain of trust. So notice how much work has gone into the simple proof that this website really is the website it says it is. That is how hard verification 
is for it to be a trustworthy thing where every link in the chain is strong. What's the claim? Clearly defined. How is it proven? Clearly defined. Who's doing the work? Clearly defined and audited. How is it shared? The cryptography? Clearly defined. So each of the four steps is really clearly defined and auditable and checkable. And so everyone can trust it. Therefore, billions of dollars can flow across that system every year. That is what it takes to make the internet work. So it's exactly the same on Twitter and Mastodon, right? (laughs) That is the gold standard they could approach. They, but no, all right. So let's ask the same questions. Let's take, let's jump in a time machine, way back machine. Do, 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 do. We are now back in last February, say, right? or frankly, any time before the summer. So there was a thing where you could get a blue check mark on Twitter. So what was the claim that blue check mark made? The claim was that the human being or organization, the account claimed to be, really was controlling the account. So if the account was, say, POTUS, President of the United States, no, sorry, I'm trying to avoid politics. If the account was <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, I'm sure you okay. had a take. If the account was Neil deGrasse Tyson and that Twitter account really was the human being Neil deGrasse Tyson, and that was the claim, the verification was, trust us, Twitter basically said, we have done the work to figure out that this guy really is Neil deGrasse Tyson, trust us. Now, there was no reason not to, so we were fine with that. How they did the work, Black ball. We don't know. They didn't tell. But they did. <laughs> and there seemed to be something to it. There seemed to be Absolutely. some sort of process. It Not everybody who should have gotten it got it. And mm. not everybody who got it maybe should have gotten it. But the, it appeared that the people who got it and the organizations that got it actually were who they said they were. I never heard anything Correct. about people who weren't those people getting it. Correct. Exactly. That's it. That's it. Perfectly described. Every every blue tick was correct, but the logic between who got them was. Ugh. <laughs> I, I never did understand, but it was correct, right? But it was and a status so, symbol more than anything else. Kind of was, to be honest. Yeah, because because they were so rare, and then the right. method of communication is simply because Twitter owned the full platform, they could communicate it by simply putting an icon next to the name. Right, because they control all of the bits and bobs, so the only thing they had to do to attest to it was to put the icon on the account. So that's all four parts ticked off. Now, as long as Twitter were trustworthy, that actually worked quite well, and we had no reason to doubt it. And like you said, there's never been a case that someone got the blue tick mark we shouldn't have that we're aware of. So the meaning of the assertion is what changed when Elon decided to... I mean, I don't know what it is today or what it will be tomorrow. The point is, the claim has become a moving target. So already our chain is pretty weak because what does it mean to have the tick? Well, for a while, it just meant you gave $8. It's not actually an assertion of anything of any importance whatsoever. This is a person with $8. That's the total sum of the claim that was made by the blue tick mark for a while. And that was proven by people paying $8 and becoming shown with a blue tick as somebody they weren't. Yeah, I tried to ask Elon Musk and there were so many fake Elon Musk with blue ticks, I never did succeed. Uh, (laughs) That's how bad Hilarity ensued is what I would say. (laughs) Yes, that is the perfect phrase. Depending on your perspective. Yeah, so what was the evidence being asked for? Well, there wasn't any. What was the checks being done? There weren't any. What was the method of communication? Yeah, they put up a blue tick. So no, the, the checks were, were being done. Checks for eight dollars. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, and checks with the other spelling too. <laughs> right, so it pretty much fell apart. So everyone's going over to Mastodon, and people want their. Given how much talk there's been about blue tick marks, people want their Mastodon equivalent of the blue tick mark. Well, is there an exact analog? Wait, but before you jump into that style. Okay. Before you jump into that, I don't, I don't feel like we put a complete bow on Twitter yet. I think you said a little bit okay. of it, but we just don't know what the current system is. There is a system now, though. Well, has it launched yet or is it announced? I thought um, it was announced. Uh, how would I the search for that? He was going to announce. He, 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 there was an announcement that there was going to be an announcement, and then there was an announcement. But has it actually gone into production? I haven't been harangued in my Twitter client to hand over $8. Okay. And I'm sure I'll be advertised that. 
Eligibility. Yeah, there is a there is a, a site help.twitter.com slash verify. I think. Uh, oh, Twitter verified accounts. Uh, eligibility. Uh, you have to be subscribed to Twitter Blue, so you have to pay your eight dollars. Um, you have to be an active use, non-deceptive. Loss of the account, the whims of people. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know whether it's. Uh, yeah, coming or going. Know. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know what it is, but I don't know that it doesn't exist. <laughs> so it may or may not exist by the time people hear this. Yeah, that's why I went for in flux in the show notes. Is my wording. Like, okay, so if you see a blue check mark in Twitter, <laughs> check your calendar. Mark just made a shrug to the camera. <laughs> if you couldn't, if you couldn't hear that, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how best to articulate that. My feelings on that. It's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, could be. Mm-hmm. So, okay, all right. So now moving to Mastodon. So moving to Mastodon, the question is obviously, well, what's the equivalent of the, this blue tick that's caused all this kerfuffle? Right, we're all moving to this alternative. So what happens to our blue ticks? Well. Mastodon is very, very different in its whole conception to Twitter, right? Twitter is one website operated by one company who have complete authority over it. So the concept of verification is very obvious. There is, there is a central authority. Twitter mm-hmm. is the central authority of Twitter. Well, Mastodon being a federated system, there is no obvious central point of authority to take on the role of being a verifier. So. That's not what Mastodon does. However, there are actually, depending on how you choose to count, there are, there's one official type of verification. There's a second piggybacked type of authentication. And there's a third emerging pseudo kind of verification. So there's actually three different types of verification that I think are worth discussing. But we'll start, we'll we'll stay on the straight and narrow. So if you read Twitter's documentation and you look for the section of verification, Twitter's documentation will describe the simplest and easiest to do form of verification. So are you, they do not. Hang on, Bart. Are you meaning to say Twitter? Nope. I'm meaning to say Mastodon. Okay. So start that sentence over. (laughs) Okay. Sorry about that. I I thought we switched gears again and I was like, "Mm, I don't follow. Okay. Yeah. So So there's no central authority at Mastodon, but it's federated. And and therefore, there's no one to give you a blue tick that says you are you. Well, we have something else. The official documentation for Mastodon, if you read it, tells you that you can verify the links in your profile. So you get to have four links in your profile, or zero to four, depending on how many you want to fill in. And they can turn green when they have been verified. So what is the claim there? The claim is that the person who controls this Mastodon account is the same person who controls that website. So it is a linkage between the Mastodon account and the website. So the level of trust you have in that linkage is down to how believable the website is. So if there's someone claiming to be a journalist for the New York Times and their link in their Mastodon profile is to their author page on the New York Times website and it's turned green, that is a really meaningful verified link. So what it does say is that at this moment in time, you have control over the content on that URL. Yes, that is the exact claim. Being Doesn't made. say that, I mean, because I could get hacked, you and, hacked you could, and you could have gotten into podfeed.com and claimed you're in charge of podfeed.com. In fact, you have the ability to change podfeed.com and I say do. it's yours. Yes, I am an administrator. <laughs> you're, that is entirely correct. Yes, I have. Because when you go on holidays, and Alistair could too, we could all become you. <laughs> I do have but some yeah, questions so, about that, but uh, let's keep going. Right, so the level of... So the the actual claim is simply that this website is this Mastodon account. So this website is actually really important because it's kind of up to you to decide if you think that is actually a meaningful verification, right? Okay, this Mastodon account is really connected to that website. Do I care? So like I say, if that is a link to an author page on a major publication, that's very meaningful. If that's a link to a profile page on a government website saying, this is the Minister for Finance, that's very meaningful. If it's a random blog by... Mr. Interesting Person, well, okay, it's the same interesting person, but it hasn't told you that much information. So bear in mind that all you're getting is a connection between the URL and the Mastodon account. 
Right. But if the person who's uh, trying to who's trying to get verified is verifying that they are this interesting person with this interesting blog, it doesn't matter whether they're CNN or the exactly. White House. It just matters that they're who they say they are. Correct. But the thing is, if someone says to you that the, their Mastodon account is verified as them, you have to say, no, the only thing verified is the link. Right. Mastodon does not claim to verify the person. Oh, right, Old right. Twitter so, verified the person, so it's different. I'm underlining the difference. Got you, got you, got you. So if you were to uh, uh, verify that podfeet.com is yours, it doesn't say that you're Bart Bouchat. It says that you have current control over podfeet.com. It says nothing about you being Bart or Allison. Exactly, exactly. Whereas the old style Twitter verification verified the human being. Nothing right. on Mastodon verifies a human being. Okay. So that is the official, and it's really easy to do because it's actually a very simple claim to make, right? You're just connecting two things together. So in order for you to provide evidence for this claim, all you have to do is put a link onto the URL you're saying is yours that links back to your Mastodon account, and that follows two very simple rules. The URL has to be HTTPS, which means you're actually piggybacking on all of that wonderful crypto and stuff that we've talked about earlier, right? So you're actually, it's kind of nice that you're piggybacking off the whole HTTPS system. So it actually means that that website has a little bit of stuff going for it. It, it is real, right? They can't, you, you can't basically manipulate things by taking over a website that isn't secured, right? It would be much mm -hmm. easier to do a man in the middle attack or whatever to fake the verification if it wasn't HTTPS. So that's just good. Very simple thing to do, say, must be HTTPS. It's actually very clever of them to do that. And what surprised the open source community come up with that. And then the only other rule is that the page at the other end of the URL has to contain either a visible or an invisible link back to the Mastodon profile with an rel attribute. A rel stands for relationship. And the value of the relationship is me. So rel equals me. So the relationship between the owner of this website and the destination of this link is that they are both me. In other words, I am claiming my Mastodon account because this is code on your website. Yeah, so here's a, here's a question. Um, Steve writes for podfeet.com. Can I have two rel equals me, one for Steve and one for me on my website? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's not saying, is this the only rel equals me? It's just checking, is there one? Okay. We're, we're having some, some uh, lag on the internet here, here, so I'm not yeah. quite sure what you just said. Uh, say that I'll one say more it time. again. Yeah, so it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, right? The question is just, is there, is there a relationship between this website and this Mastodon account? One website can be related to multiple Mastodon accounts. One Mastodon account can be related to multiple websites. So you could have multiple links on the page that says rel equals me to Steve's account, rel equals me to your account, rel equals me to my account if you wanted to let me claim ownership of something, right? It, it doesn't right. matter. As long as there is one to that account, it's happy. That would also suggest you could have several uh, URLs. So you could have Bart, uh, uh, B, whatever it is, uh, Bart B dot IE and uh, let's dash talk dot IE. You could have them both verified as you. I could because you, your Mastodon profile marks. has up to four. So you could have up to four tick marks. Yeah. So in, in the show notes, you said that it has to be uh, in the, uh, an A tag in the page's body or an invisible link in the page's head. That's not correct. You could do it in the footer, which is where I was t actually instructed to do it. So not just uh, the head. Okay, footer. Oh. Right, the link tag belongs in the head to be a valid piece of HTML. So link rel equals belongs in the head. It may, it may work for Mastodon validation, but it's invalid HTML. And an A tag has to go somewhere inside the body. A footer is in the body of your web page. So I put the URL they told me to put in, I put it in the footer. And it no, okay, but works. the footer is in the body. The footer is in the body. Is it visible on the page? Okay, you said it had to be in the head. Okay, oh, no. because it's visible, it has to be in the you, body, and the footer's part of the body? Yeah, everything that... So your web page at its lowest level has a bunch of headers that are invisible, and the content, head and body. Your content contains a header, a page body, and a footer, but they're all in the body tag. Right. If you view source, everything is in the body. 
Okay, so if I was uh, to be creating a an HTML page by hand, I would know that. I would have would not have asked that question. The way I work in WordPress, I have a theme and the theme has a nice little GUI and it says, where do you want to put this? And I push a button that said footer. So when I saw head, I was like, it wasn't in the header. It was in the footer. Now I see what you're saying. OK, yes. um, so to put a link in the body, where, where in the body would you put it? Anywhere. The well, footer, anywhere is header. not an answer <laughs> in no, no, today's is... blog post. Yeah, as long as when you go to the URL and you do a control F on the page, you find it, then it is there. Wait a minute. The uh, link is invisible. I well, the find invisible it. link goes in the head section, so that is in the source code. So if you do a view source, you'll see it. You know, head, title, equal, title, all that stuff will be in the head. Okay, the so I'd have to find head. Goes in okay. The head. Okay, so mine is visible at the bottom of my uh, web page, and I just wrote it, follow me on Mastodon is what the link goes to. <laughs> yeah, because it can be any text, right? Between the opening and closing link tag, it can be any text. That's not part of the spec. All it says is that the URL has to be to your Mastodon profile, and it has to say rel equals me. Okay. So you're actually very okay. free to, to mess around with it. Okay, so with all that faffing about explaining that, what we have said is that putting this text on your website verifies that you have control over that website. Yeah, and it connects so, together the website and the Mastodon account, and that's it. That's all there is to so it, because you, the claim is so you, simple. So whether you run your own website or not, if you're just looking and you see somebody says they own bartb.me, that just says they have control of bartb.me. It doesn't say they're Bart. Correct. I wonder if that site exists. I may now have to go register that. The other thing, I did some testing because I was not, because my website redirects. So if you go to bartb.ie, you get redirected to bartbushas.ie. Uh, so I added two links to my profile, one to the final resting URL where you end up after all the redirects and one to bartb.ie. And they both turned green. So verification will follow redirects. Okay. Which is nice to know. Because a lot of people have a shorter, nice URL that then redirects them to a longer URL. So that, that's good to know that works. You One can make really a lot annoying... of fun of the way I named my website, but it's only seven characters, so. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, one annoying caveat is that validation happens when the server feels like it. So your instance is running a cron job every N minutes that it does whatever background work it has to do. Or one of those background tasks is do all the verifications that are outstanding. So it will happen when your instance feels like doing it. And so you'll hit save and nothing will turn green and you'll think you've done it wrong. Walk away. Just <laughs> go away, do something else and come back in some vague amount of time and it will have turned green. Or it won't, in which case you'll have to try again. So it, it took me three days to get mine working and I'm not entirely sure what did it in the end because, well, I, I don't know how long I was supposed to wait. Maybe I had it right all along. Maybe there was never a problem. I don't know. Did you fiddle with it? Of course I fiddled with it because these show notes were coming up and it wasn't working yet and I was fiddling, you know. <laughs> I actually put it in two places, so I'm not sure so whether right. it's working. I don't know which one fixed it. I have it in the head and in the body. It's like, well, what the heck? <laughs> I have one. Uh, oh, where is it? Oh, I created a, uh, uh, a button that says, uh, follow me on Mastodon on podfeet.com, I think. If I remember correctly, this was you a few did, weeks ago now. You did, I went to look on your website to see, how, see if I was doing something silly. I was like, well, Alison's works. Alison's is green. How did she do it? <laughs> so okay. I don't know whether that one's actually functioning. I, I think that one probably isn't. It was a little bit weird. But if you look at the very bottom, it says, follow me on Mastodon. And that is, the, uh, that is actually the rel Definitely equals love. me for that one. Yeah, because the other one has a rel equals quote equals rel me or something. There's something a little weird going on. Yeah, it was part of a little box I'm stuck in in my theme and stuff. So I was just kind of flailing around going, well, I'll throw it in there. And then later on, I thought, well, I'm not sure that's going to work. So let me put it in the in the footer. So I don't know why it works, but I have me a blue check mark. And it just has to be one of the links has to be correct. So a blue check mark, uh, you know, you have a green check mark, not a blue one. Green. Or green, sorry, green. <laughs> Happier color. So that is the official type of verification. Connect your Mastodon profile to your website. Some very clever and very nerdy people realize that if a URL can be verified, then with a little bit of writing up a spec, you can verify a cryptographic public key. Because what you do is you use a service called KeyOxide to link your public key to a URL, and then you connect that URL to your profile, and now your public key is connected to your profile. 
Okay, 100% lost you. No idea what you're talking about. Start okay. over. Imagine what? you're a person who wants to do encryption using using public key cryptography. You might okay. be a journalist who is hoping someone will leak them some sensitive data. So you need to publish your public key to anyone who wants to send you information completely secretly. So okay. They can encrypt with your public key, and the only person on planet Earth who can decrypt it is the person with your private key. Now, if I'm a leaker and I want to send you information, I need to have some confidence that I'm using the right public key. Because if the FBI snuck me their public key instead of your public key, I would be in deep doo-doo. So okay. by being able to link the public key to the Mastodon account, I now know that I really am talking to that Mastodon user when I use that public key to encrypt. Okay, so how do you do that? Now I understand the, so, the, the reason uh, to do it. So there's a, web, uh, there's a web service that's open source called KeyOxide, and they provide a way of publishing your public key at a URL that will also include a Mastodon link in the URL. So it's a web page that has two pieces of information, the public key and the Mastodon URL. So it will turn green when linked in Mastodon, and it will contain the public key. I feel like I'm just being real slow, Bart. I didn't follow that. Okay. Uh, uh, right. Key oxide okay, magically effect. says these two things get to go together, but how do they how do they verify you, that? You, okay. You as the person who wants to publish your key set up a key oxide account and you on your key oxide profile publish two pieces of information. Your Mastodon URL and your public key. Okay. Now that Why can't I URL, take my Mastodon uh, URL and your public key? Because your public key is you, publicly available, so I can take Bart's and attach it to my my Mastodon URL. Okay, what good is a public key if you don't have the matching private key? It isn't, but I could do it. I don't. But Absolutely I don't see what. Key, but I don't see what key oxide's doing then. If it's not, there's no verification. But there's no way to put your public key on your Mastodon profile without some website in between. The problem to be solved is to get your public key onto your Mastodon account. This is a website right. to help you do that using Mastodon's ability to verify a URL. But I thought I, a, <laughs> I thought I needed control of the, that website, and I don't have control you, of Keyoxide. You have control of your profile page on Keyoxide. Okay, so it's a profile page. So you will set yourself up on Keyoxide with a profile that has a URL that's just for you, that has two pieces of information. Your Mastodon URL with a rel equals me and your public key. You then take that URL for key oxide forward slash pod feet. Okay. And you put that into your Mastodon account as one of your four links. It will turn uh, okay. green. Okay. Because it's going to go to key oxide, it's the, to the URL I gave it, and it's going to find the rel equals me. Yes. Therefore, when someone goes to your Mastodon page, they're going to see one of your links is going to say GPG. It's going to be green. And it's going to be a okay. link where they click on it and they get your public key. So that is now okay. connected, those two pieces of information together using verification. So, again, it's, you know, it's not something most of us have to do. But if you're interested in sharing public keys, it's really nice to be able to connect your public key to your Mastodon account. And have is it that something green. you're going to do? I don't know because I don't. I, I believe the concept of GPG is nuts. I believe in the. <laughs> key, I believe in the public key infrastructure. If I need a certificate, I will buy a certificate from a certificate authority. So I'll use S MIME, not GPG. But I am not a journalist. I okay, so you just think this does world. exist? Okay, all right. And people are very passionate about it. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> the other thing, then, which I think is really cool, is a side effect of Mastodon's federated nature. So your username on Mastodon is at something at somewhere. The at somewhere is a domain name, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are, say, the White House, you could run a Mastodon server at POTUS at whitehouse.gov. So at whitehouse.gov could be the server or the instance. Sorry, I keep on saying server, I mean instance. But that actually means that only the White House could have set that up. So if the White House say, and only people who work here get accounts here, then anyone's username that ends in at whitehouse.gov must actually be at the White House. 
So I'm glad you picked the White House as a uh, as an example, because uh, there is an account. If you search for White, the White House on Mastodon, mm-hmm. you will find one called the White House. It has a big green check mark and it's pointing to at White House at Mastodon dot cloud. So that's not at White House dot gov, therefore not. Actually. Well, but but <laughs> so, let me just tell you what's on it. It's, it's okay. a banner photo of a different president. Okay, so this is not this is not this is definitely not the White House, but that that check mark tells me that whoever created this account owned a domain that they said was theirs. But it's but just looking at it up front, it doesn't tell you what domain that was. Well, it does because the link goes somewhere. So where does it go? That's why I just said just looking at, at this green check mark, it does not say anything about where it goes. You have to go into it. Uh, I'm not even sure how to go into it. Yeah, no, I, I don't do see... Do they even have a green link or do they have they just put an emoji of a check? They mark might have put an name? emoji in. Yeah, that's probably what... That is what it is. You're right. That's an emoji. So... <laughs> there is an example of... Because the actual signal is when you go to the profile, the links turn green. It's not at the end of your username. It's the links in your profile. So if you if I click on... If I click on your icon, I get to see your profile and your profile has a link to podfeet.com and the link to podfeet.com is green. If you go to my profile, you should see two links that are both green and my GitHub link that isn't green yet. because I haven't figured that out yet. Oh, that's interesting. You can do your... Well, I can, you can do it. Yeah, except for the fact that GitHub strip out the rel. So I need to do a little more figuring out there. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm I'm really curious here because the client I'm using doesn't even doesn't appear to let me go in and see the the per, actually no, let me look for you. Sorry yeah. for doing this real time, but I'm really curious why I'm not able to. I'm not even looking. Uh, what, what what are you on Twitter again? Uh, at B- Bibu shots. At Bibu shots at Mr. with no vowels. Well, That's trust okay. me, with your spelling, there's not two of you. <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. Okay. Okay, so when I go into yours, th- that's the difference. So when I go into yours, I see the um, I see website, homepage, and GitHub, and I see green check marks and green uh, URLs for your your website and your homepage. That fake White House doesn't have any URLs. Yeah. So there. Yeah. So again. So this came up because a friend of mine said, "Look, I'm following the White House on on uh, on Mastodon." I looked over it and I said, "No, you're not." <laughs> But it wasn't this one. It was a different White House that wasn't the White House. Yeah. So, hmm. what, so what I'm talking about here is the the after the second at is the server, and you can't fake the server, right? So no, but the server I'm, they could have White House on Mastodon social. That would be I, I know unlikely of them, but they could. Right. So okay. That, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if. The bit after the second at is something of value. It really is something of value. What are you defining as something of value? I don't know what you mean. If it is a domain name that has a meaning. So the two examples are that the European Parliament have a Mastodon server at EU at parliament.eu, or I can't remember the exact URL, but the, at, okay. the, at their actual domain name. Okay. And okay. the German government have set one up at the actual domain name for the actual German government. You can't fake the bit after the second at. So if it is something that is real, it is real. Okay. And so okay. that actually is a way of adding real verification. So the European Parliament have said, we will not give Mastodon accounts to anyone who is not actually with the European Parliament. So every Mastodon handle that ends with at European Parliament or whatever it is, mm-hmm. really is someone connected to the European Parliament. The German government have said, A... We want all officials to use the official Mastodon, and B, only authorized people are allowed on to the official Mastodon. I, I don't don't say official Mastodon. That that's the official German that, government Mastodon instance. Thank you, instance. Yes, uh, I'm just saying, there's not an official yeah, 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 Mastodon. No, fair, 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 okay, fair, fair, very fair. Um, I think an example that people could, uh, everyone here could probably uh, connect to is Federico Vitici is uh, officially moved to Mastodon, not, not staggering back and forth, but moved. And his, uh, his handle is at uh, Vitici.net. Ah, there so we go. You know so he's he's federa- 
that's an example. Yeah. Yeah. And another example is that Leo Laporte is offering his listeners who subscribe to his um, membership doohickey at twit.tv Mastodon accounts. Yeah, he was. And I, I'm actually a member stop? there. And uh, he, he got too big and he had to stop letting people in. And it was right after, uh, shortly after I had uh, I had joined the, his uh, member program. But uh, I, I saved or? so... I, no, I didn't end up asking. I, it doesn't really matter. No. But it's kind of nice though, because only people who are actually in his clubhouse can have his, can have accounts at twit.tv so there is you know again it's an example of it tells you something right because if you have yeah. a twit tv account you are actually a listener right right uh let me correct myself it's vitici at maxstories.net i said vitici.net perfect it's vitici yeah, so at maxstories.net he if doesn't have Mac a green check mark also. though <laughs> but like i say the actual second domain name you can only be at that domain name if you if they let you in so if that, if that domain name belongs to an organization then that organization let you in so it is actually that second ad is very valuable so you're saying to create an instance with at MacStories.net, you have to own MacStories.net? It's a DNS name. Yeah, that's how that's how the traffic gets rooted to the instance. Okay. okay. Is DNS. So you actually genuinely have to own the domain. Cool. It's just like an email address at podfeet.com has to be at your mail server. So if you right. ran your own right. Mastodon instance, it would have to be on your domain and you would have to set the DNS record. So it really would be you. I am if, not if even any... vaguely interested, but, you know, I could. No. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, if people are doubting whether this is actually going to be a thing on, on Mastodon, I didn't make any bet that it is really going to be a thing. But a, um, a journalist, one of the ones who got banned recently, said that when he first got banned, he had 1,200 listener or readers on Mastodon. And by the time they were interviewing him about it, which is what, two, three days later, he has 20,000. Wow. The yeah. other thing I see it really, the other place I see it really taking off is in European governments like Germany, where there's a strong open source ethos at the government level. So they have a very strong ethos for using open source software for government applications and for things that involve the public. And so they're very keen to see something that isn't controlled by any specific company take off. So the fact that they've spun up their own Mastodon instance means they're really serious about this. And I would say it will become an important communication mechanism for some European government. Interesting. Yeah, I, like I said, I wouldn't have bet that this was going to be the thing, but... I, it may have legs. It may it's, have legs. It's uh, yeah. It's it's maybe not flying yet, but well, it's it is a big elephant. <laughs> it's tromping through the jungle. <laughs> Although if Dumbo was taught me anything, it could fly one day. There you go. <laughs> anyway, so that is that is my. Uh, it all came out because I wanted to figure out how to make my links turn green, and it ended up being a big discussion on what it means to be verified in the abstract sense. But I think it's a good conversation to have because I think whenever you see someone claiming. Well, I'm a verified blah, blah, blah. I always ask, what's the claim? What's the evidence? Who did the checking? And how am I sure it's really true? <laughs> yeah. And it, I asked Bart before he started this, I said, I don't understand how you're going to make a whole conversation about this for 48 minutes. I, I said, uh, you know, I copied the link they told me to put at the bottom of my website and I was done. <laughs> and and he said, yeah, well, there's a little more to the conversation. I thought this was really interesting to help us make sure we keep thinking about what that verification means and what's behind it. Yeah, yeah. And it's important all over the place, not just on social media. It's just an idea that I think is important people have in their heads. And like, I did promise you between 45 minutes and an hour. So Yes, you did. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Well, I hope you have a great happy holiday and I appreciate you jumping in and giving us one last show before the end of the year. I was, it was literally my absolute pleasure. Today is the first day of my annual leave for, for the Christmas period. I'm oh. finished work for the year. I am done. I saved up my annual leave to have it all to take at the end of the year. For me, 2022 is now purely fun. So oh, I'm in a complete dogs. holiday mood. So uh, <laughs> definitely want to wish everyone lots of, what is it I said to my colleagues? Um, joyous, delicious, and peaceful holidays. That's what I want everyone to have. Delicious is really important. I stuck that in the middle. All right. I think there's no better ending. Thanks a lot for coming on, Bart. It was my pleasure. And remember, do remember to have lots of happy computing.
have to end on that, sorry. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chit Chat Across the Pond. Did you notice there weren't any ads in the show? That's because this show is not ad supported. It's supported by you. If you learned something, or maybe you were just entertained, consider contributing to the Podfeet podcast. You can do that by going over to podfeet.com and look for the big red button that says support the show. When you click that button, you're going to find different ways to contribute. If you like to do a one-time donation, you can click the PayPal button. If you want to make a recurring contribution, click the weekly Patreon button. Or another way to contribute is to record a listener contribution. It's a great way to help the No Silicast Ways learn from you. If you want to contact me for any reason, you can email me at allison at podfeet.com and you can follow me on Twitter at podfeet. Maybe you want to talk to other No Silicast Ways. You can do that in our Slack group at podfeet.com slash Slack. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.